All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the psychology of social engineering. I can understand that you're probably going, what is he going to be doing with a psychology talk at a technical conference? And it's all about expanding your mind, or in my case, hacking the living bejesus out of it. So I need a volunteer. <laughs> You'll do it. Essen, come on. Um, do you have a phone? Yeah. Can I have it? No. Come on. No. Come on. <laughs> Can you unlock it first, though, please? Of course. No, please, I'm please, I'm can I'm you un can go unlock it? Yeah, see. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's how you social engineer a phone off somebody. <laughs> you go and ask them for it. Ben, thank you so much for actually making the point. Appreciate it. I was going to flick through your photos, but gee, no. Um, the, it is very, very simple. Social engineering is, if you learn nothing from this talk, it is dirty little tricks to get your own way. That is everything that's going to be using it. Now, I kind of thought when I originally proposed this talk, I came up with a very nice title, the very appropriate title of The Psychology of Social Engineering. After thinking about it a little bit more and trying to say, how do I advertise this and market this to tech people, I said, this will probably work better, hacking the human OS. <laughs> because, ladies and gentlemen, we are all given a human operating system when we are born. It comes in a perpetual beta. It is constantly being upgraded. You constantly discover new features, uh, quirks, and bugs in the system. And as you get older, you discover that you forget things. Your memory lo you lose, you lose memory. You forget. It's like you know when you're. How many of you use Chrome, in your development tool? How many of you have like 80 tabs open at any given time, right? Right. How many of you are wondering where the music's coming from? <laughs> Do you ever have an earworm in your head? It's like. Da, 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 da. Yeah, now it's all in your head. Just think when birds suddenly appear, all right? And now all of you are going, you bastards. That's going to be in my head. And the easiest way to get rid of it is keep singing to the end of the verse. How many of you know that one? So, ladies and gentlemen, this is me. I am Niall Merrigan. I am the head of cybersecurity for Capgemini in Norway. And I didn't even spell my company name right. Well done, you. Um, I am a Microsoft MVP um, for the moment. I'm an ASP Insider and Azure Advisor. These are all fun titles. And you can tweet me at Merrigan. I like when people tweet, use the little bird at me and don't give me the bird. Um, and I do take emails at capgemini.com, and you can visit my website and all this. It's nice. So I try to explain that social engineering is all around us, because I have a little five-year-old son, OK? And he's awesome. Um, but he kind of says, he doesn't know what I talk about. He just thinks dad goes abroad, he talks to a load of people, they laugh at him, and then he comes home and I get Lego. It's a really good solution. Papa, are you going out traveling again? Yes, awesome. <laughs> you like me leaving? No. So I said that all the time we see social engineering, it is constantly in plain sight. And I showed him this photo. And he goes, that's a cool fox. I went, I know it is. But do you see all the naked people in it? And he goes, huh? I said, there's people in there. Is there people, Dad? And I said, there's people in there. And I hopefully this will work now. Yeah, excellent, it does. So he said, there's a, like, a leg, there's some feet, there's a bum, and all this. And he goes, there's people. And I'm like, yes, there's people. And he goes, why are there people there dressed like a fox? I said, it's art. Or that's what your mother says, anyway, at least. <laughs> I don't know. But this is, this is it. And now he's like going, does that, does that fox have people in it? Does that fox have people in it? I'm like, reminder to self, never show a five-year-old like, in, in this type of thing. But it kind of illustrates the point that a lot of the stuff I'm going to show you today is hidden in plain sight. For every one of you, you've probably seen this on a regular basis, but just don't realize how subtle or how even obvious it is. Because you know, how many of you are kind of wondering, well, is advertising really social engineering? And I would kind of argue that it is a yes. Because if you look at this picture, what do you see? All answer. Come on. You can understand my accent. I'm Irish, right? You don't understand. <laughs> Perfume. Well done. Who said that? Well done, you. Person with eyesight. Good job. Um, but like this is how do you sell a perfume you can't smell? Yes. <laughs> Not with you, though. Thanks. A bit forward. But she's right. <laughs> Sex. And what it is, is it's an aspiration. It is an aspiration. In other words, I am going to sell you an image or thought that you could be this man. You could be this man with designer stubble, a perfectly knotted tie in an open collar shirt. It's like it's a sartorial mistake, but still we'll live with it. And there's a woman leaning in going, 
I'd love a hamburger. <laughs> Take me to McDonald's. Or something to that effect. But it is literally they're saying, you wear this, you can be this man. All right? It's, for men, this is a huge aspirational thing. It's like we are kind of driven by this. We want to find a mate. And it's, this is what they're trying to sell. You smell like this, you can be this guy. And this is what you're buying into. And it gets, this is relatively soft, subtle. If we go like Dolce and Gabbana, it's a bit more intense. You could be this man who broke the... <laughs> is this subliminal? If this is subliminal, oh my god, what is going on over here? You got this. <laughs> I got this, I don't got this. Okay, come on, you can do this. Hang on a second. This is where you go. You wonder: Is the speaker any any really good? Yes. Now I'm told I have to stay here. So this is Dolce and Gabbana. Okay. This is how, how should I say? Very overt. <laughs> it was. I swear to God. What did you guys know? Uh, this was happening last talk too. This was happening last talk too. Yep. All right. Okay. This is not good, dude. If you're behind there flicking the switch, would you stop? I know I just insulted you. Couldn't count past four. <laughs> I didn't mean it. Man can count to 20 with his shoes off. 21 with his pants off. 22 if he's got a weird. Now, are we good? Yes. Do, am I okay? Don't move. Move. I feel like, you know that, you know when you got the old TV box thing going where you're like. <laughs> so how was your talk, Noel? I saw a blank screen. It was awesome. You all right? Yep. You freaking out? No. Oh, good. <laughs> I am. It's a good thing I'm Irish. I can talk fast and I can entertain the crowd. Anyone else got a mobile phone I can play with? <laughs> he lost it. You lost it. I'm losing it up here. <laughs> there's literally, this is subliminal. By the time they're finished, what, what did you learn? I want to be in the ocean with piercing <laughs> blue eyes. Are we good? Should I just stand over there? No. It's fine. Do you want to just stand there for the entire talk now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> Do I have to switch laptops? Um, no, it's, not a laptop. it's not a laptop issue? Oh, that's all right. <sighs> Whoa! Jeez, don't do that. <laughs> this is not going to fix the projector. Are we good? Stand by one? Should be? <laughs> Speak again. <laughs> At this point, I'm afraid to freaking move. <laughs> This is really going to uh, screw up my dance routine. That dilling, that dilling. Yeah. So, can we, you got this. We don't got this. I'm honestly thinking we just run it through somebody. I'm a, bit, I'm a bit worried about a guy touching my laptop. <laughs> I, just hacked, I just hacked my cable. Do you, uh. Yeah, 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 would you? <laughs> well, so, um, right, I'll explain a little bit while I'm here. Uh, I'm trying, maybe. Maybe it's just this slide. For every man. Yeah, it is that slide. It doesn't... It, there we go. Right, quickly, before it disappears, okay? You could be in a man on the Aegean Sea with piercing blue eyes, no chest hair, and looking phenomenal, and smell like this, okay? That is what they're trying to sell into you. Now, all of us know this, right? We, we know that this is kind of fairly obvious. But there was, a, there was one company that kind of said, you know, men need to smell better. Because in the 60s, men smelled like dustbins. We smelled like rubbish, farms, foundries. We were manly, and women wouldn't come within 40 miles of us. But that was the way we were. We were brilliant like that. Women smelled lovely. And someone decided, wouldn't it be great if men smelled lovely too? And someone says, that's a great idea. What do we call ourselves? Brute. Everyone heard of Brute? Brute is a fan. Jesus, this is like really wrecking my head. Um, hopefully this will come along. Dude behind there, you're really screwing up my presentation, but it's fine. Anyway, Bruce said, what we'll do is we will get, make a scent that men will like. And the thing with Bruce is, if you go into a room when anyone's wearing it, it nukes everything else in the room. There is no other smell in the room. 
right? There could be a rotting dog and no one would smell it, all right? That's it. It is unbelievably powerful. It is literally like it's a green bottle of liquid plutonium, you know? It's weaponized. This is getting weird. Now, the thing is, the advertising campaign was very kind of funky because what they did was this. For every man who wears Brut, there's a woman who it. loves what he smells like because there's something about Brut that's nice to be close to. Honey, I was just thinking about you. Brut, it smells like a man. And it was very obvious, it smells like a man. So what they did is they said, what are we going to do to make men buy it? We'll tell it smells like a man. Okay, men go, I want to smell like a man. So they bought it. And then women said, well, and wives, and especially uh, kids would all do this. And Jesus, this is getting weird. <sighs> Sigh. Why do you hate me, this room? Honestly, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, we'll continue talking, because I can do this through interpretive dance as well. Um, it's not as fun, though. Let's try this. Escape. Shift out. Dance. No. Please. For every man who wears brute. So are we going to just like stand here or just do stuff, or should I just like tell people to go home? <laughs> don't know. OK, we'll say nothing. So the next one they came along with was someone said, let's up the game, right? And who do you think up the game? Everyone knows this. Come on. If you were given brute, given brute is your daddy? Who? All Spice. Exactly. Let's see. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. Yeah. But if he stopped using ladies' scented body wash and switched to Old Spice, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. Where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. What's in your hand? Back at me. I have it. It's an oyster with two tickets to that thing you love. Look again. The tickets are now diamonds. Anything is possible when your man smells like Old Spice and not a lady. I'm on a horse. And so they, du they double down. Smell like a man, man. And <laughs> All right? The thing is that this is, like, if you want uh, to understand this, men were given this, and this is a very successful advertising campaign that worked, that transformed what was a very feminine product into what would be a masculine product. This was the concept. It was a transition. They bought, they made people buy into the idea that you could smell like a man. All right? They socially engineered people to use soap and water and then smell better. OK? That's what they did. And the thing is, this is an aspirational thing. We do this on a regular basis. When we look at things like underwear, OK? They, they say, by wearing Calvin Klein's underwear, you can look like this. Why you'd want to look like this, I don't know. Most, <laughs> right? The thing is, most men look like this. <laughs> now, you're all laughing, but it's true. The thing is, it's very obvious, like we went, OK, he's the poor chap, he's squeezed into them, but he, got, he, did, he did his sucking it in, he's doing well. You know, he's like most men. Most men will only discover a six pack in the supermarket. They will never have one for themselves, OK? But the thing, we look at this and we go, oh yeah, you know, Photoshop. And actually, they did. So the, you can see that they enhance certain parts of his body, including his biceps, all right? Now, this, I, I was kind of told this talk had too much skin. Meh, we'll go with it. So the, 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 this is selling using, you can be an aspirational, you can have a body like this, you can be a success like this by wearing Calvin Klein underwear. But they're not the only people that do this. Another, another branch of advertising does this exceptionally well, and that is car manufacturers. This is a Kia SUV, or it will be when you see it. <laughs> it's there, right? Now, I want to point out a couple of things. How that gentleman parked. Like that, there we go. Gentleman parked like that. Didn't hit the manicured lawn, you noticed, all right? And then decided, I can't find my keys, we're gonna have it out on the patio, okay? How many of you own a Kia? How many of you want to buy a Kia? <laughs> but this is the thing. And then we're saying, well, that's using sex again, but what about other aspirational techniques, such as, for example, the great outdoors? And I will hopefully see a BMW. This is a BMW X6. Most BMW X6, right, do not know what off-road is. The most they'll get off-road is probably a curb or a speed bump, okay? Or when they park wherever they park, okay? This is because they said, okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna make it exciting and thrilling. And you can, if you own this very expensive car, you can off-road like this. Why you would want to? How much does a BMW X6 cost in the UK? A lot of money? 
A lot of monies? We'll say a lot of monies. Okay? Why you would want to park a lot of monies where you would get very, very damaged is beyond me. But Photoshop helps a lot. Now, they are selling an aspiration. They're selling you a concept of you can be outdoors. You can do all this stuff with this car. You probably won't. You'll probably spend a lot of money for, for features you won't really care about or potentially ever use. That knob on the dashboard, which we call uh, an indicator, you'll never use that either. But OK. And that is what they're selling you. But the thing is, they're selling you aspirations. What about those that sell you a problem first and then sell you the solution? Hopefully, it'll appear. This is getting very trying. Oh, my God, man. This is like, you know, this is how to really kind of sh show if a speaker can manage a crisis on stage. <laughs> okay? Uh, at the moment, I think I'm 50-50. Okay? 60-40. <laughs> <60 40. laughs> well done. 70-30. We're losing badly here, kids. Seriously, dude. Is there anything you can do? I can, run, I can put my own projector up. I can run it off my phone. <laughs> Little small phone. So men magazines do this. They will say, summer shred, get ripped, show you a six pack. If you go Googling for men's magazines like this, you will find it just a plethora of six packs. Now, it is exceptionally difficult to get a six pack or because it is a low fat content. It requires a lot of good effort in the kitchen. It requires a projector that works. Um, <laughs> But you also use effective lighting, the down lighting to apply definition. But they are selling you a problem. They say, you could be this masculine. You could be this good looking. You could do this. Buy this magazine, we'll show you how. All right? But this has nothing, absolutely nothing on women's magazines. All right? And I think this is where we have a huge social problem. Because if we look at this, this is women's health. And this is one of the most, um, I tried Cosmo and other things. And Jesus, you can't put those on stage. But like the thing, it says, eat up and slim down. You are, you are, you, we don't, didn't think you were fat. You are. You, even if you try, this is absurd workout, you won't look at her because of Photoshop. We've seen this because people are Photoshopped on this. But they are selling you a problem you don't even know you have. All right? They're saying, you could be this good looking. Why aren't you happy in your own skin? because I'm not that person. But they are socially engineering or advertising to you to say, this is a problem. We can help you fix it. You didn't know you had the problem before you started looking at us, but now you know. Now we also have the solution. It is basically dirty little tricks to get whatever you want. All right, next slide. Let's hope. This is really hard. <laughs> Does anyone have any idea? I'm watching two technicians out there. It's like, how many technicians does it take? Are we three technicians? Oh, Jesus. It's the rule of thirds now. Let's, it's like they've gone extreme pair programming. They brought a third one in. <laughs> you have to the I have to describe the slides now. So I've got, this is like, oh, this is actually like, you know, how do you describe, have you ever tried to do a presentation for the blind? Yeah. It's very difficult, all right? But this is kind of cool. So what we have here is an anchor in a boat, when I show you, maybe, hopefully. Oh, God. This is going to be one of those ones where I'd say, don't bother showing the video. It's just Niall sweating on stage. He got, uh, uh, so how was your talk? I'm 70 kilos lighter. <laughs> <laughs> what was, what's your secret? Stress. <laughs> Lots of stress. <laughs> OK, I'm on strike. I'm going down here. <clears throat> uh, We're going to have to try. OK, I can sit down here. If I don't. Do, I'm going to try back here. This will be an interesting talk conversation. How does this work? It could be like, you know, I'm, I, I, I don't know. Are we good? Yay, yay. There's going to be, well, I think this will be the last talk in this room, I think. <sighs> no. <laughs> so <laughs> we've all now discovered who has problems with their eyesight, who gets uh, really bad headaches when stuff flickers, and when speakers get annoyed. Is there anything I can do to help? <sighs> okay, let's try it. So let's talk about let's talk about let's talk about cognitive bias. Cognitive bias is one of the, we all have different biases. We all have different things we do to kind of that we innately do, but we don't realize we do. We are biased towards our friends. We are biased towards our family. In other words, we will accept that they're what they are telling us is true. We have another thing called cognitive bias, and one of them specifically is called anchoring. It is when given a piece of information, the first piece of information you're given about something, it becomes the anchor point for all other decision-making processes. All right? It's like the idea, 
Scott is a fantastic security researcher. He's the best. And then everyone has a reference to Scott after that. All right? It's kind of that kind of concept. Hi. I know. We just might lose it totally for a few seconds. It can't be any worse than what we have. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try and switch oh, yeah, yeah, sure. No problem. I'll, just, I'll keep talking. We'll keep going. We'll be fine. I'm sorry. So cognitive bias and anchoring is a very, very strong thing. Now, we, get, we, see, we see this every day when we are seeing things like, for example, when you, go look, when you look to the slot today for this point, you had five options. The first one you had when you read was your anchor point. Is it going to be better or worse than Phil Hack? Is it going to be better or worse than, is Rob Connery better and worse or whatever? That was your reference points. We have this all the time. We see this amazingly with uh, things like, for example, ad, uh, pricing. All right, but like, let's see if we explain, let's see if this works. Let's go forward, did it? Did it? No, we lost it back here. Anchoring, how we choose by comparing with a nearby reference point. In other words, the fi which fish is bigger? If both fish are the same point, they're, it's because they're inside in different bowls. But the idea that you have a reference point is very essential for us to make a decision. And the masters of using anchoring against you are Apple. Let's see if this works. This has a very long delay, does it? Whoops, there we go. So what you can see here is the first one you read, because we read from left to right. In most, in most when Western are kind of using Latin uh, uh, text, we read left to right. So we see eight gigabytes, it costs $229, all right? $230, give or take a dollar. But this is a common other technique, we use in the Magic 9. Now we look at the next one. It's $299 for 32 gigabytes. It's four times the, four times the storage of the first one, for $70 more, all right? What have you ignored at this point? The base cost of the first one. Because at this point, you, you've accepted that 229 is the base cost. You're not challenging that it should be up or down, because the next one is 299. The following one, which is 399, is thir twice again of the other one. It's not eight times more, it is only twice more, because you, the previous point you used to anchor again. It's like a ladder. So the, com the thing that will happen is people will do one or two things of the following. They will look at the 8 gigabyte and go, I don't want the 8 gigabyte, it's too small. The 32 looks like the best value because it's only $70 more and it's, and it's four times the space. The next one's $100 more, but it's, it's big and I kind of don't want to spend $400 or $399 on something. So I'll, I'll spend the one in the middle. And that is a funnel for you that they will buy 32 gigabytes by default because most people will take the best value, what they think is the best value. And in this case, for most people, it is gonna be the 32 gigabytes. But you haven't questioned the price, because you don't need to, because you have an anchor point as the first point, and it works. And this is a really essential point of how pricing models can screw with your head. And the worst thing is, and when someone puts all the details in front of you, and you don't even notice, Wi-Fi is $499, $599, $699. $500, $600, $700. $700. Below it is Wi-Fi 3G, 629, 729, A29. We're not even comparing that it's 629 or 500 to 630. We're going from left to right. We're not going up and down because our brains don't work this way. We don't compare. And we have been given all the information. However, we are using these as our anchor points for what we should buy. And this is a common technique that is used by, uh, for example, cinemas. When you have, like, for example, you can buy the medium, the regular, the large. It's also something that's used by, for example, coffee shops. You can have the small, the medium, the large. The large will cost you plus three. All right? And that's a concept they'll use across the board. And the reason they do this is it's dirty little tricks. This is a numeric technique because our brains are, find numbers hard. We have all know about the magic nine, right? Everyone knows the magic nine? Magic nine is when you see 599, what do you see? Do you see, a lot of people see 600. A lot of us see it's not, it's not 600. You, it's 599, it's below six. It's under six, so it's not 600. It's one dollar short, a very minor amount. 99.95, for example, is still less than 100. All right? The magic nine is, means that people will ignore the value below that or uh, after it and just say, that's it, that's fine, it's not a problem. The 99, even though it's still one dollar, give or take, with rounding, it is still ignored. So it's like when you go home, honey, I bought these new, I bought these new speakers. They cost, me, they cost me less than $400. How much do they cost you? $399. <laughs> now, when I say it like that, 
People laugh. That's insane. They're $400 now. No, 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 they're 399 They're under four. Case in point. It's a dirty little trick. Now, we can also do this with, like, for example, um, with other pricing models like this, where we are going to say, how much are we going to get our users to pay? So we put the first one up, which is the biggest one, and let people find the, the lower price. Because free is over here, and people don't really want, we, we don't want people to run with free. Okay? Scott, you probably did this when you were trying to work out pricing models for your new, your new thing. By the way, use this software. It's freaking awesome. Um, and I don't get paid to say that, by the way. But, um, yeah, <laughs> yes. Social engineering myself into a new paycheck. So most people will end up going for bona fide, which is twenty nine ninety five. It's thirty dollars. It's still under the thirty dollar limit, but it's only five cents because the reason is they will look at this and go one ninety nine. That's, that's too much of a jump. Sixty nine is too much of a jump. I'm only doubling the price here, and I get I get five users. So I've doubled my price. I get five users. I get unlimited forms. I get my, so this is kind of like yeah, I'm getting the best deal here. This suits my needs. And, that's, and you funnel them into that position that they will buy from you at that point. Now, you're probably wondering what all this has to do with social engineering. These are the types of tricks that you can do to break people's brains. Okay? Now, if I show you this one, which always makes me laugh a lot, it's the New York Times. They had, hi, they had this option to buy their subscription. You got a basic subscription. It was $8.99 a month. Remember the $8.99? You got two free things. The power of free is exceptional. We had the all access, $14.99 a month, four things. And then we get the home delivery plus free digital access for $4.50 a week. Aha, uh aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Didn't spot that one, did you? You spot the numbers, but you don't spot the week, which means there's now a different value. And the problem is that when they did this originally, they had, the New York Times had $89 for their digital content um, online access. They had $129 for their newspaper delivery. And then they had $129 for their newspaper delivery and digital access. Which do you think most people picked? They want online for $89, delivery for $129, or delivery plus online for $129. Which one do you think they went for? Yeah, why do you think they went for delivery plus online? Why is it better value? It's not, it, but it, it is exactly what you thought. Because the thing is, you've got two things for the price of one, and the thing is, it's, I'm, I'm getting the digital edition and the home edition. Okay, cool. The digital edition is all I really wanted, but I bought the, 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 the subscription because I wanted the two things, because it's nice to have, and potentially. So they upsold you for $40. But did they really lose any money in giving you two things? Not really, because they, use, they create the digital edition, and they use, use the digital edition to create the print edition. And what was the end game of the New York Times? To sell more newspapers. So by using that little dirty trick, and it's not a dirty, it's a very efficient marketing technique, they are doing it in such a way that it makes it very easy for you to buy more things. Now, sorry? <laughs> Did it? What? Squeeze me. Wait, 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 this is a really slow, so there, what am I asking? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even notice that one. Nice. It's even weirder. It did, I didn't even notice that bit. Good eyes, I thought I was being very smart, and I was like, no, you're an idiot. Uh, anyway, let's talk about fishing. Let's change the subject completely. It's like it, it hasn't been a trying enough uh, presentation already. <laughs> oh God, this is going to be one where I go in the history books and going, never doing this again. I'm leaving now. We're finishing. So fishing. Everyone thinks fishing is the Nigerian prince sitting out in somewhere going, hi, I've got 50 billion euros. Do you want to help me get it out of the country for a loan of 5,000? Yeah. Fishing is a very interesting technique because the, the thing is, it is about gaining trust or using different techniques such as FOMO, fear of missing out. This is a very powerful technique. You know, last minute deal, last time to buy. People will there going, when they are put within a time constraint, they will try and buy it because it makes sense. Because now they're, Ooh. it's why another one, for example, another form of really good advertising and really good market placement is when you go shopping in a um, airport. They have what they call the magic 10 minutes. It's that point when you get through security. 
You've got through security. They've managed to not find anything that made the thing go beep. You know, you've put all your stuff back in the bag. You still have your passport. You still have your money. Holidays beginning. You're in a little bit of exuberance. You're happy. And you go buy stuff. So that's why all the tax free is right beside security. So you'll go, oh, shiny, nice things. And, they, and all the previous advertising we showed you is now used against you. But when it comes to phishing, we are going to use different techniques against you. And like, I always say that the one where you do spam email, that's just boring, that's dragnetting. That literally is you hope you find something. The more targeting we do, and we call it spear phishing, is a more advanced form of um, phishing techniques. It's really, there we go. It's a phishing technique which we use where we will use information about you to gain your trust. And we get information from everywhere because humans leave massive digital footprints around the internet, all right? Think about what you put on Facebook. Think about what you're on Twitter, Google, et cetera. The most common one of, for example, spear phishing, which I like to use, is the idea of watching check-ins. You know where you kind of get someone checked into a bar or someone checked in somewhere, okay? So you see a check-in, and you go into the public timeline, you find this person's checked in, and you email them saying, listen, we found your wallet, or we found some cards belonging to you. Can you click the link on this picture to see if it's yours? And people go, I was out drinking last night. Oh, I, I, oh, maybe, oh, geez, did I lose something? Did I forget something? OK, click the link, and it opens up something, and all of a sudden, I've got some more information. I've just gained your trust, because I know something about you. And by using that against you, I can generate trust to you, and that is what will get you to do stuff for me. Dirty little tricks to get my own way. The problem is that we do, this is like where we call spear phishing. We go looking for specific people. We will also do a thing called where we go after like sea level execs. We call it whaling because they're big fish, all right? Or big mammals in most cases. But we use this a lot where we're going to try and attack very high level CEOs and get them to do something for us. Or we go after the most powerful person in the company. Who's the most powerful person in the company? The administrator, the PA, to personal administrator to the CEO. In generally, is always because the CEO will go wherever she's told. She'll go, I need you to be in Geneva this week. Here's your tickets. I need you to be here for this meeting. You have this. You have this. You're told to go somewhere. You do it. Right? The PA manages all that. But the PA is also the person that you have going to try and attack because they're geared up to answer your questions. Hi, my name is Niall. I'm calling from Capgemini. Um, listen, I'm trying to get hold of Joan. Um, do you know where she is? Uh, no, she's out traveling? Oh, okay. Um, I'll give her a call on her mobile. One, got information that she's out traveling. Now I can use that information to go and attack someone else. I can send an email from Joan to finance, which has happened a number of times. You, say, you send it from the finance director. You send it to the finance department late on a Friday. Okay? Sometime around month's end if you can do it. Right? You get them when they're stressed and in mission mode. When people are in mission mode, you put something in their tray, they'll get it done. Busy people get shit done, okay? Lazy people will go, oh, I don't have time. Busy people, people who have to get something done, if you put something else in their tray, they'll just push it, they'll move it, they'll move it, they'll move it. So you send an email saying, I need you to transfer money to this Ukrainian account at this time because we're gonna lose a contract. Make it so, get it done, I don't have time to wait. Fine, get it done, Shh. all right? Some Ukrainians going, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Very simple. You think it's funny? Number of companies get done on a regular basis because they will be sending information. Someone will send a quick email on their behalf of somebody where the other person cannot reply. The usual thing, I can't reply on the phone, I can't do this. Have you heard like you know, the Western digital scam, please, you know, uh, Western Union scam, where they say, please transfer me some money, I'm, not, I'm un unavailable. It's the typical thing when you hack someone's account, you'll say, I'm out traveling, I need to get some money, can you send this? And you'll, it's a real odd thing, but it works because people want to help. Now, the thing is, it's because of this and because of all this human error, we have like this data security problem. Because the thing is, we protect the infrastructure. We protect our IT landscape. We protect, like we have firewalls, we have antivirus, we have BitLocker, we have all these mad tools, and we have Dave. All right? Now, Dave is every single person in this room because Dave has done something stupid when Dave shouldn't have done something. We've all done it. One of my favorite uh, remembrances of when I thought I was hacked, <laughs> I arrived in Seattle. I log on to Facebook. Okay? I, just, I, I, I connected over VPN, logged on to Facebook, and I went, right. I didn't realize where my VPN was going out of, okay? or it's something to that effect. And it comes up, you have logged in from Guatemala. 
I said, I don't know why I haven't. I'm in Seattle. I'm definitely not in Guatemala. I was like, oh, God, I have to rotate pastors. I did something. And then I go, okay, I've rotated all the pastors, done everything. I was like, oh, God, what happened? So I tracked back all through what my steps were. I had logged in. I'd done this. And I didn't, have, I didn't connect my VPN first because I was jet lagged. It's a, it's a mistake. I was tired. Jet lag, it happens. And I went, okay, what happened? I looked and said, where is my IP? It said, this IP. And it goes, in some databases, this is erroneously de described as being in Guatemala. I was like, aha. So for me, human error could have been a very costly mistake. But it is a very obvious thing that I have all these safeguards in place for myself. But human error is one of the things we use on a daily, as a social engineer to get us to, do, uh, to get things done and also to get people to make mistakes. Because when people aren't being observant, they make mistakes. Case in points. This is the LastPass login. It's a beautiful piece of kit. LastPass, like any other password manager, keep, means I, I can free up some memory so I don't have to remember passwords. Except, what is wrong with this screen? It's a website, exactly. Let's see if this works. Doop, 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 doop. Boom. It's Chrome extension dot PW forward slash colon forward slash some gibberish. It is what we call pixel perfect phishing. And what we'll do with this is we'll do two things. One, we will detect if you've got the LastPass plugin first. It's an easy detect because LastPass injects script into this, into, to allow the logins. The other thing we'll do is then we'll do a thing called tab napping. We'll wait for your tab not being in focus for a number of, a number of minutes and then pop this up, okay? And you'll kind of come to this thing and you'll go, oh, crap, um, I need to put in my password, I'll put in my password, do something, and I'll steal your credentials. Now, I have two-factor auth on anything that has any type of sensitive data on it, and this wouldn't work. But this is a very, if you are tired, or if it catches you in the right place at the right time, this steals all your usernames and passwords. One shot, we kill, done. And this is why we call perfect, Pixel Perfect Fishing. This is available on GitHub, by the way. You can go off and download this yourself. And it's available for a number of different logins. Now, others that like, we see a lot of the time are for other types of phishing is we use things like iCloud. iCloud is a fantastic resource if you're trying to fish people. In 2014, we had this massive data leak involving a lot of celebrities and their, and their naked pictures being released. And this is because either through a number of things, dodgy assistance, but most likely through phishing emails. Now, you're probably wondering, Niall, no one would fall for findmyiphone.help. I'm like, they probably wouldn't. However, let's change it a little bit. Let's create HTTPS apple.com.something.mywebsite.com. It's a subdomain, all right? You get a free certificate, you make the thing, and then you shrink this down to a phone screen. The URL is obscured. You see a green padlock with HTTPS Apple. You go, this is legit. I put in my username and password, something happens, boom. And the thing is, people will do this. People will fall for this. Because there's like, for example, this kind of idea when you use SMSing, or smishing, as they call it. So this is a couple of things. One, there has been unusual activity in your account. Please log in to decline the purposes of this many things. Now, if I was in London, this wouldn't be a problem. If I was in London, this potentially isn't an issue. However, when, if I'm in Norway and I see this, I get a bit worried. Right? And it's not exactly difficult to send a text message. But getting to click on a link like this where it says your bank, but it's not your bank, and it comes up with that nice look, great. Well, there's also the fact that you can use SMSing to get it to do, for example, how do you bypass two-factor SMS authentication? Everyone familiar with what two-factor auth is, right? It's a second uh, identification mechanism to ensure you have control of the account. Many people send like two-factor authentication, like for example, they will send an SMS, please, your, get, your, for example, your GitHub login uses two, uh, SMS for 2FA. But how would you bypass that? Maybe by doing something like this. We recently noticed a suspicious sign in attempt for this email address from this IP. If you did not sign in for this location and would like to lock your account temporarily, please reply to this alert with a six-digit verification code you will receive momentarily. If you did not authorize this sign-in attempt, please ignore. I've got your login. I need your SMS. I'll just send you, an e I'll just send you a link to say, listen, you're going to get an SMS, and it's going to look dodgy, but just send it back to me, would you? It's quite simple, and it is very, very simple to do. You just go off and you buy something like Atomic SMS. You do this. You send off an email address or send off a, a particular number, and you're done. 
Now, the reason SMSing works much more effectively than phishing by, phone, by straight like emails is because SMSing is considered more personal. It is coming straight to your personal device. We have moved from a kind of a, a situation whereby we expect to get, we don't expect to get emails to where we, and we had lots of snail mail, to now we get one snail mail and a ton of email. All right, that is our transition. We have moved over to digital. But SMSs, we don't get a lot of SMS spam. It still costs money, it's not free. But still people get it. And the thing is, and people are more inclined to look at an SMS than they are anything else. The ultimate form to generate trust to do phishing is using voice, as illustrated by this. So I invited a few of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. Do you want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation. And basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back. <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. OK. Hi. I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me OK? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan, and we just had a baby, and he's like, get this done by today, so I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information, and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying, and um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, At gmail .com. Jessica gets access to my personal email address. Now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah. Well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Jess uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just basically blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they, they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, women, the ultimate social engineer. <laughs> I, I I joke. I, I but the thing is that they, the things that were exploited here. First off. No one likes hearing a, wo a mother in distress. With a crying child, we all want to help. We are geared up to do this. We are socially uh, kind of conditioned that we should help people in trouble and distress. And also, I'm in customer service. So my job is to help you. And I could be a superhero, so I will. All right? The second thing is, nobody in their right mind would ring when and, and, and be evil like this, would they? No, 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 no. That's why voice solicitation, why you can get someone on the hook for something like this, especially by putting just a woman in distress, crying baby, these are triggers for people to say, oh, you need, really need help, okay? And this is the problem. We are going, we are going to use dirty little tricks to get our own way. We are going to go contra to what po people would think would be good manners and good behavior. And why so, this is why social engineering can be, for many people, so difficult to spot because it doesn't, it's not, it's not the kind of, oh, someone doing that wouldn't really be evil, right? Okay? And this is when we start looking really into social engineering, we start having to use whatever things we were given to get our way. Now, when I show people the things like this, this is a lovely pregnant woman, okay? Pregnant women aren't evil. Pregnant women are lovely. They cr they're creating life. They are perfect in every way. When you get on a bus, as a pregnant woman, most men will jump out of their seats to give it to you because they know it's difficult, right? This is a thing we do, right? Okay? And for this, we're going to use this technique to break into a building. 
Now, there's a, a really good social engineer, and her name is Jeff Hyde. And what she did was she said, right, let's try and get access to this very secure facility, and let's do it by just general, no non-technical means. So they, they went off and they said, first off, we're going to do a bit of recon, all right? So the next, they do off things like, for example, social media gave us detailed pictures of their badges, all right? So if you wanted a QR badge or a badge for, for this conference, you just have to go back to the NDC London Twitter stream and you'll get one, no problem, off you go. And then you say, well, we dumpster dive, we got some internal kind of information, phone extension, laptops, all this type of thing. Now, the thing is, Jess said, this really won't get me into kind of where I want to be. Now, Jess is not an unattractive woman. And she goes, I look like this, right? And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pretend to be pregnant. And so she gave herself a fake belly, all right? And she became pregnant. And this is awesome, because inside in that belly is a ton of Wi-Fi hacking gear. She's gonna give birth to a lovely router. <laughs> it's gonna give free Wi-Fi to the world. But this, it's gonna be like Jesus Christ. Now, this is not enough, because at this point, you still have capacity to open doors. So what else do you think you need? Coffee cups. Yeah, no, you need a couple of coffee cups. Because if you're holding coffee like this as a pregnant woman, Ankles are killing me. And you walk in like this, most men will open doors, no problem, won't ask a question. We're good like that, you know? And off you go. And remember, I, didn't, I can't remember who said it, but first, but coffee carriers, fill hands, etc. walk in, no problem. And the confirmation was, between the belly and a bunch of coffee, I had people opening, or jumping to open doors for me. Again, dirty little tricks to get your own way. Now, as I told you at the start, I'm Irish, okay? And when I do my social engineering thing, I play up to my Irish stereotype. Oh, I didn't be garden, isn't it great? I'll just throw a potato at you, lovely. <laughs> That's, I'm drunk, it's fine, don't worry about it. Where's the nearest pub? And people will be like literally going, that's ah, fine, he's Irish, and there's never, not, never an evil Irish person, it's fine. But like, <laughs> things you can't say, things you can't say in London, I just realized in the middle of a talk. <laughs> Sorry. International Incident 101, okay. So the thing is that we could use the, the very, very typical stereotyping of, for example, he's Irish, he's lovely, won't be doing anything bad. In the 60s and 70s, it wasn't so good, especially in London. Irish people were stereotyped as being terrorists, okay? We were, We'd, like there's, I have pictures of signs, uh, no dogs, no Irish, okay? It's, and you laugh, but this was the case. But the thing is, now when I go abroad, I play on my Irishness all the time because it gets me out of so much trouble. Walk down the middle of Australia drunk, not a problem, he's Irish, it's okay. You know, you can do dodgy things, you can get away with it, and that is because we are using a stereotype. Everyone thinks American cops eat donuts, okay? It's a common stereotype. People's brains have a bias, and when you confirm that bias, it will be accepted as true. There's a really weird thing. You hear a piece of a fact from somebody, right? And you say, oh, cool, I heard that fact. And then someone repeats that fact independently of the other person. You go, oh, I heard that fact. And I, that's, yeah, and I, and I know about this as well. And a third person confirms this, and then it becomes true. We also like to call this thing Twitter. <laughs> it's true. We, as in Twitter, we're in our own little echo chambers, right? So this is a common concept, and this is one of those weird things about the brain. We have certain biases, and when we are told something and it's confirmed by someone else, it becomes truth and logic. And it's really weird. It's one of those weird little bugs in our software. Another weird little bug in our software is the fact of that if I offer to do something for you, you will trust me less. Think about this. So the idea is this. If I ask you to do something for me, you'll help me, and you begin to trust me, and I can ask you to do something bigger. Contrary to that, if I offer to help you first, no, what do you want? It's the initial reaction, right? I want to try a weird experiment. Walk down any street and say, who wants free money? What's the catch? Why? Okay, no one. Dude, can I borrow a fiver? Yeah, sure, no problem. Not a problem, and the thing is, this is a weird thing. The, it's, we call this the Benjamin Franklin effect, whereby by asking someone to do us a favor, we will gain more trust than by offering to do a favor for them first. It is a really weird bug in our software, and it is a common thing we do as social engineers, because people like to help. Hi, 
Is this purchasing? Great. Hi, I'm Niall from Capgemini. Uh, listen, um, I'm having a problem. I'm trying to reconcile this PO. Listen, I just sent you an email with the PO and as an Adobe attachment. Can you try and open it for me? Oh, you got it? Good. Can you open it? Great. Oh, what happened? It crashed? Uh, do you, what version of Adobe uh, Reader do you have? Oh, you have, a, you have 8? Oh, I'm using 11. Maybe that's the problem. Listen, it's just before lunch. I'm going to try and get this working. Um, but uh, listen, thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. You're being an absolute star. Super goodbye. And that inside in that little Adobe attachment was a nice little ro remote access Trojan. But the person opened it because they wanted me to help them. But by on generals, they would never open it. Okay? If you ask someone for help and you say, can you help me? People will help you. All right? If you offer to help someone, no, 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 no. It is really weird. So the takeaway for you today is that social engineering relies on different psychological, sociological, and physiological levers to get our way. We do this in the form of, for example, um, what we call, there's another technique, for example, to get your way, and it's very, very bad to use, but it generally gets your way in a very effective manner. It's used upfront aggression. Get in someone's face, tell them what you want, and as, start, as soon as they start agreeing, back down. They think they're winning, you get what you want. It's a very nasty technique, but it works because people are not concentrational. And except to the one where you find the person that is, and then you're kind of screwed. But <laughs> how'd it go? Oh, so good. Um, but this is a common technique. It's in other words, like it's for example, you get into someone's face, you arr, 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 and then they go, Oh, I'm gonna help you. Good, 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 good. Calm down, smile. Woohoo! Yeah, bye bye. I did this once to our neighbors who were having a party. So I rock up in my rugby shorts, it's minus 10 degrees outside, and like I'm in bare feet, rugby shorts, and a, a t-shirt, it's three o'clock in the morning. And I rock outside and I'm like, excuse me, do you know what time it is? He goes, I'll run in and check. <laughs> Damn you literal Norwegians. He comes back out, it's three o'clock. I said, I know it's three o'clock, it's time to go to bed. Get into bed, go. He goes, oh, okay, okay, I will do it. Thanks very much, bye now. <laughs> and your man was like, oh, okay, fine. And he walked away. And he was happy that he avoided confrontation. I was happy he went to bed and stopped like smoking dope outside my house. But it was still OK. But that was the kind of idea. We use different sociological, psychological, and levers to get our very effective way. Social engineering is about dirty little tricks to get your own way. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for putting up with a very difficult presentation to give. <laughs> I would, like, I, would like you to, um, I would like you to open the floor to questions. Um, I would love you to rate the talk. If you didn't like the talk, come to me. If you did like the talk, give me a green. Um, <laughs> any questions? Yes, sir. They no, they weren't my fingerprints on the finger side. They were someone else's. I was going to make a joke like your mom, but I said that would probably be mean. <laughs> Go, mamas. Um, anyone else? All right, then, ladies and gentlemen, class dismissed. Thank you very much.